Next Wednesday's Inside Story here on BBC Wales on One highlights the massive problem of organised social security theft. I was unemployed for um, six, seven months and I took jobs that I didn't really want to do. I want these youngsters to come out of uh, university understanding what the word profit means. I'm a bit horrified when I hear the industrialists talking the way they are talking tonight. Good evening from Monte Carlo, behind me the famous casino where fortunes have been won and lost for generations. But this time in Monte Carlo there's an even bigger game, five very high rollers. And tomorrow night there'll be four big losers. But of course there'll be one winner, and that win will involve hundreds of millions of pounds. Because the winner will be the city that will host the Olympic Games in the year 2000. And also in sports night we hear from a man who's already a big winner. Nigel Mansell, Formula One world champion, now the IndyCar world champion. The first driver to hold both titles at the same time. Plenty of football. England's World Cup group looks a little clearer. Holland have played tonight, so have Norway and Poland. We have both those games, plus the big match in Scotland, Rangers versus Celtic. Championship boxing features Gary Jacobs defending his European welterweight title at Wembley. And for anyone who fancies a bet, how about a win double? Manchester for the Olympics and Europe for the Ryder Cup. History suggests there'll be a weekend of drama at the Belfry. for the Ryder Cup. Oh, and it slipped by the edge. We talked to the Ryder Cup captains, Tom Watson and Bernard Gallagher. Well, can Manchester win the Olympic Games for the year 2000? The stakes have already been high. They've spent £5 million just making the bid here. And tomorrow, the members of the International Olympic Committee, approximately 90 of them, will make their decision. Five cities, of course, are involved, and Barry Davis now reports. Manchester's bid had first to silence the clamour of cynicism at home and then by proving it had learned the lessons of four years ago, convinced the world. The suggestion this week, as they brought their case to Monte Carlo, is that backed by the government, they've gone a very long way to doing both. 
uh, bidding cities. There are lots of people who've been to Manchester, had a marvellous time, thought it was a great place, thought it was a fantastic bid, and if the bid and the, and the decision had been taken the following day, I have no doubts at all they would have voted for Manchester. But of course, all that is sort of past now, and we have to, we have to have got to a more even keel. The public relations exercise has been conducted with style and vigour. Compliments of the Olympic president accepted as no more than politeness. Do you think their chances are improving now? Well, I think the, uh, the chances are very, very high. The strengths of the bid are 15 inner city sites with 21 of 25 sports within a 20 minute radius. And the quality of telecommunications, described in the technical report as leading the world. The weakness, a perceived lack of glamour. I've always thought, actually, in this race, even more than I did in the 96 race, that the three front runners are seriously flawed in the minds of the IOC members. Beijing has a clear political problem. Um, Sydney has a clear distance problem. And Manchester's had a clear image problem. Um, and, but funnily enough, the, the image is, is why we want the games. I mean, we know that if we can have the benefits and glories, as it were, of an Olympic game, games that Barcelona got, then we know you have a new place in the sun. I mean, that is what the Olympic Games gives you. With government aid, a velodrome and what will be the largest indoor arena in Europe are under construction. The main stadium remains on the planning board. I think we've got the balance right. You know, there's a 21st century dream out there which they can realise. You know, we're not going to be showing them stadiums which will be seven years old when, when they're occupied. They will be state-of-the-art when they're built, but we're actually building as well. You, you, we, couldn't have, we couldn't have left it to models. We had to start building. Twice Britain has answered the IOC's request to host the Games in 1908 and a second London Games in 1948. Both for Scott and country, it's been a long wait. The timing is impeccable. We have a, a Prime Minister who's very keen on sport and has made a very very good impression on the IOC members. We have a new and dynamic head of the, of the British Olympic Association. We have a city that has really got to understand what the implications of creating the infrastructure needed to, to, to run the games and to prosecute the bid have been. And we've raised something like three and a half million from the private sector in the last two and a half years, which for anybody who's been in the money raising business will know has been probably the most difficult period in in any of our lifetimes in terms of raising money. At this morning's press conference, it was spot the face time as past British champions lent their support. I think if we win, I shall be overwhelmed by the awesomeness of the task we have ahead. Um, I mean, no Olympic run-up is ever easy. Um, and I, I think while the rest of us may be celebrating, I think I shall go into a quiet corner and think, blimey, you know, what have we got to do now? Um, I think if we lose, um, I'm sure I shall shed a tear, but uh, I just don't, I just will not see it as defeat. And I, it's rather like I think an Olympic, I think we have done our PB. I mean, I think we've, I think that's one of the good things about this campaign. We don't sit there sort of, you know, we've had a marvellous partnership created with the, the BOA and with, with the government and with the city. And we've, we've pulled all sides of the community together in this sort of dream. So. And I think we've prosecuted the bid extremely well. As a setting, Sydney is on its own. A traveller's dream, a yachtsman's paradise. Their events would further highlight the harbour. The IOC's technical report said that its bid offered over and above what is required. Eight existing facilities, only four dependent upon success, and 14 sports within walking distance of the athlete's village. But as decision time approaches here, there's a feeling that the Australians may have pushed too soon. And a thing of beauty is not a joy for everyone. From being an athlete, I can say that when you travel to a place, getting ready for the Olympics, you want to make it as comfortable and as easy as you possibly can. And in 88, we had the US team and the British team both were in Japan for nearly two weeks before we went on to Seoul. And that's difficult. At least in Europe or in England, if the Olympics are at Manchester, 
people can stay at home longer. It's an old argument Australia has won only once. But Sydney, which may by 2000 be the leading city of a new republic, is meeting the challenge head on. Free travel for competitors, adjusted starting times for television. We've clearly looked at it and we would program the events according to times where the greatest interest lies. So those sports which are of greater interest in the United States and the, the Americas, you would look to schedule into those time slots, knowing that you're always satisfying the, the Asian Australian market anyhow. And those that are more European dominated, uh, let's look at uh, fencing, uh, football, uh, handball, volleyball, etc., uh, will be timetabled to suit those markets directly. It will be 4.20 in the morning Australian time when the winner is announced. A city of 140 ethnic groups is planning a firework display on the Harbour Bridge in the hope that the IOC wakes up to its needs. The free man's image of Beijing is of Tiananmen Square. Yet, just four years after killing its own, China's capital city invites the youth of the world to celebrate the start of a new century. Neither the fact that they've since held the Asian Games nor the recent release of political prisoners has done anything to blur the image. With regard to human rights, I should say that we attach great importance to human rights and now the Chinese government is doing its best to improve the uh, living standards of the Chinese people by the end of this century. The amount by which world records were beaten at China's recent national championship adds further to suspicion. Leaving aside the economic problems of the country, toward Beijing the Games would be a risk. What would happen if China's aged leader should die? And what may follow the return of Hong Kong? Too soon is the plea of most, yet many IOC members with a reforming zeal, with thoughts of a special Games for the millennium, and perhaps what the technical report describes as the enormous marketing potential, may decide that for a country approaching a quarter of the world's population, the time is now. So if China wins the bid for the 2000 Olympics, I believe it will help make China open still wider to the outside world and help promote the development, our social development and the development of various undertakings. Germany looks back on its two previous Olympics with regret the Nazi Games of 36, the Israeli Massacre of 1972. Now Berlin seeks to thank the world for helping to open the Brandenburg Gate and bring about the reunification of Germany. Its mood here has been happy. We are confident that we have a chance that, well, that to, win, to win the bid. I'm sure that uh, our friends in the other building cities will say the same. And that's the way it should be. That's good competition. And I'm uh, perfectly happy with the notion that the members of the IOC take into consideration the totality of the arguments which speak for or against the city. At home, there's been strong opposition. The money spent, it said, should be put to better use. Well, money is very much needed for housing and for solving all of the problems, not only in Berlin, but in many countries of Europe. But what many people don't see is that the money that goes to Berlin because of the Olympic Games is going to Berlin only because of the Olympic Games, not for other reasons. The bid is in a city base with 14 new facilities and offers to the world in a new century a new German face in an old refurbished setting. What we would like to see is that um, out of the historical uh, responsibility which we take from the time of 36 and following, we will be able to show to the world, or to present to the world, Olympic Games of the Democratic Germany.
Istanbul, where East meets West, and where Christian, Jew and Muslim throng the streets together, is being seen as the complete outsider. But every criticism of their bid is met with firm but friendly rebuttal, a reminder that the games are seven years hence. The problem of transport. Istanbul does not have a metro yet, but it is under construction. We have the uh, traffic congestion in the central part of the city. The facilities on the drawing board will be ready by 1998. The instability of the region is accepted. If Olympism is about peace, I think Istanbul represents a center of a region where the peace is needed most. So where else but Istanbul that the torch should shine? And it's here in the Sal Omnispor of the Louis II sports complex that the decision will be made known. Juan Antonio Samarin will step forward and with pomp and not a little drama, open an envelope and announce that the games of the 27th Olympiad in the year 2000 have been awarded to the city of... Only then will we know how that verdict was reached. At the moment, there are 89 voting members of the IOC. Although one of them, the Egyptian, is not very well and may not be here, so the voting could be down to 88. An absolute majority is required over all the other bidding cities. Decision, of course, could be reached in one round of voting. If it's not, then the city with the fewest votes is eliminated, and on we go to round two and so on, and so on, if necessary. Bob Scott is confident, but remains philosophical. Well, I mean, I, I sort of rather feel that, you know, God will provide a lot of things, and amongst other things, he'll provide Friday, you know. I mean, it's, 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 we've been waiting an awfully long time. It's been a very long journey. Um, but I think we're sort of prepared for the result, and I think, it's important to, to, to prepare yourself to win and to lose. I mean, it's so close to call, who knows? Now, Britain has two members on the International Olympic Committee, uh, Dame Mary Glenn Haig and, of course, the Princess Royal, both former Olympians, incidentally. I guess their votes will be going to Manchester. But earlier, I spoke to the Princess Royal. Can I ask you first, I suppose members of a bidding country are allowed um, to admit the support for the city involved, are they? I mean, oh, you, I think, you... that, that, yes, tacitly, that's what they've been saying for since the bid started. But equally, there is no doubt that it's, it's a lot easier when you think it, it's a good bid, and it is a good bid. How much influencing goes on between members of the IOC? I mean, how, how much changing of mind goes on? Would you influence other members to vote in your direction uh, who were sort of sitting on the fence at this stage? Would you know that they were sitting on the fence? Well, an awful lot of it is, is done in the visits and in, in your sort of normal meetings and IOC sessions and discussions. I think probably you'll find that the British members are slightly more subtle than um, some other uh, members in their approach to this particular problem and, and, and really rather encourage the concept that it's the techni technicalities and the bid and the people behind it that, that sell themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's important, in, I believe, and I think we both believe that. There are differences of opinions in what is important in the bid, so you're not always going to strike the right note with everybody. But equally, you can but ask people, you know, whether they've been to Manchester, whether they've enjoyed the trip, what they felt about the facilities, and if the many weak points, what they thought the strong points were. And and that I think we've we've achieved. And you might nudge them a little bit if they were sort of wavering a little bit then, perhaps. Oh, I'm, I'm exceedingly old-fashioned about things like this. It's entirely their problem, but you can, but, you know, put it across as best, best you can. Yes. D does the president's a powerful man, uh, the president of the IOC, mm. um, how does he influence votes? I mean, do you get a general sort of feeling, a, a, an awareness from him about where he would like the next Olympic Games to be, or the year 2000 Olympic Games? Well, you're, actually, you're asking the wrong person, and, and I suppose both Mary and I are the wrong people to ask, because probably the only two IOC members who are never lobbied by anybody else is, is us. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know what, quite how you read that, whether it's good news or bad news. There, there is talk about uh, how people feel the president thinks about specific bids, but you, very few will know more than that. Yes. He, he doesn't overtly say, now no. listen, lads. Um, well, he may do to some people, but he's not going to do it to me. And 
if I haven't heard him say it to anybody else, I'm unlikely to <laughs> um, be able to comment. How much do you feel um, political issues come into the decision making? I'm thinking particularly of, uh, there's mm. been an awful lot in the press about uh, you know human rights in China, etc. Well, every every time you have big cities, there's usually a political element to one or other of them, if not all of them, in, in some way. And there are some IOC members who are, are more influenced by that political factor than they are about the technicalities of the bid or the individuals running it or the financial backgrounds. You, you can't cater for everybody having the same approach to, to a bidding and politics is bound to come into it in some respect. But you wouldn't know how strong an influence that is in, in, in the likely voting at this stage, or would you? If, if you look back through the votes, it's not consistent. Uh, in, in the sense that in, in other years, when bids have looked to have been politically very strong, have not been as successful as, as the assumption uh, had made it out to be. Yes. yes, it will have an effect. But equally, the, the other X factor is personalities. And there is no doubt that the individuals who sell the bid are very important. And I believe that Manchester has actually made a great success in that respect. It's a very popular bid team. People have them around. Well, with me now, Manchester's favourite son, Bobby Charlton, and Chris Brescia, Olympic gold medalist back in 1956, and father of the London Marathon, of course. Uh, Bobby, what's the mood in the camp? Mood's good. We've uh, spoken to most of the IOC members. We've re We've uh, spoken to all the delegates from federations, etc. And, and the mood is that Manchester is a very popular outfit. Uh, of course, Bob Scott, the chairman, is, is particularly keen, you know, to, to foster good relations with all the IOC members. That's been our tack. Uh, we've not spent millions and millions of pounds on trying to convert the converted. And uh, it's been a big success. We feel very friendly. Uh, a friendly atmosphere whenever we see an IOC member. I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that we've We've been here before, um, and they've all been to Manchester. Almost all of them have been to Manchester. They've seen what we've got to offer. And uh, with our heritage and our tradition, etc., you know, they've got a, a little affection for, for Great Britain and for Manchester in particular over this last couple of years. So I'm very hopeful, very hopeful, really. Thanks, Bob. Right? What's your objective point of view, Chris? Well, Peking are beginning to be um, favourites quite strongly. I, mean, I think it would be a disaster for the, for the Olympic movement. But uh, after all, the IOC did go to Moscow when it was under Brezhnev, and there, was, there wasn't much human rights in, in Russia at that time, and there are not many in China now. But um, funnily enough, if it comes down to just two in the last vote, say Manchester and Peking, then the thought is that Peking won't get it. Either Sydney and Peking, Peking won't get it. It must get it on an early vote when there are three or four candidates still in. You think and that's people a wouldn't possibility. Pick, uh, Peking on a second choice? I think there's some, enough members of the IOC who've got a conscience and will just shy at that last thing of picking it when there's just two choices. I see uh, Juan Antonio Samaranch is still in business for another four years, the president. Yeah, he was elected in Moscow in 1980. By the time he's finished, he'll have uh, served 17 years and he'll be 77. But then it's a very old committee, you know. A lot of them are over 80 and yet they're de dealing with the culture of the masses and the culture of sport. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Well, the big decision, of course, uh, is tomorrow night, and we'll have a special programme on BBC Two at 7 o'clock. We'll have that decision then for you live. Well, something else that has to be decided is who's going to play in next year's World Cup finals. That's as unpredictable as how the voting will go in Monte Carlo. England's rivals in European Group Two are Norway, Holland and Poland. All three have played tonight. First, Holland, their principal aim, goals against San Marino and Bologna. John Motson is the commentator.